Thank you, I'm the CIO here and um, I live in fear that none of the tech is gonna work. <laughs> Especially Wi-Fi. You know, you take Wi-Fi out and just people go nuts. I don't know what it is, but. I'm here to share today what we're doing at uh, UC San Diego uh, with Generative AI. We're focused on two main categories. A as an enterprise, meaning administrative processes. And secondly, there are uh, several use cases in academics and teaching and learning that are starting to pop up that we are also supporting. And I'll just jump right in. We're calling it Triton GPT. We just had an announcement go out today uh, that the world can look at at our new sites online. I'm gonna talk about our strategy overall so you get a sense of uh, the enterprise strategy, the use cases we're envisioning, our overall architecture, and how we're gonna be collaborating with other institutions on this. Now as a CIO, I live in the land of politics, people, policy, and budget. So you'll have to bear with some of the CIO speak as we go through here. Our strategy is kind of simple. We're doing everything on premise in concert with our supercomputer center, SDSC. We want to take advantage of their deep knowledge and, and expertise in AI, and we've done that. For the last seven years, we've been running our machine learning platform for education. Uh, that started as essentially a clone of the architectures in SDSC. That's been going strong. We've added to that uh, two and now a third set of uh, DGX cards into it. And to power our generative AI on premise. So that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is we're focusing on kind of what Ilkai was talking about, this vertical AI thing. How do we get the generative AI focused on our content? One of the things we're learning is the more it's focusing on our UC San Diego content, the less we need a big sprawling model. We need the language expressiveness and skill, but not necessarily all the content. The other thing we're trying to push is pursuing small models versus bigger ones and use open source everywhere we can. So right now our platform is pretty much 100% open source. And why are we doing that? We really want to democratize the AI to make it affordable to any. A lot of my CIO peers are sitting in uh, negotiations with OpenAI and other cloud providers. And we're gasping for breath. In fact, at one negotiated meeting, one of the vendors announced a price, and that's what you heard for another two minutes. <laughs> Nothing. They came back a few weeks later with another price. That's what you heard again. They came back with a third price, and we said, well, that could maybe be a chargeback service, which is not a buy signal, folks. That's called, maybe I can fob the decision off on somebody else. The pricing is just too high for virtually any organization. I'm talking to my corporate peers in CIO land, same thing. Uh, everybody's kind of scratching their head trying to figure out what's the economic case here, and I think we have a path here. There's a very interesting article that came out several months ago in 2023 uh, describing the ability to figure out what use cases are going to make sense as a jagged frontier line of cost and performance, for which it's uncertain which lies inside the frontier line, meaning it's going to be cost effective, and which is outside. And I think that's what a lot of organizations in the enterprise are struggling with, exactly what should we do. We focused very hard on, let's start with mundane, simple, straightforward things that save people time. We'll talk about that in a bit. The other piece I wanted to point out is this research discovered that generative AI for knowledge workers works best when the knowledge worker exhibits critical thinking skills. If they slavishly copy from the AI, they actually do a little bit worse. Now, I had to tell a bunch of administrators that. It's sort of like telling the administrators, just because computers get smarter doesn't mean you get to get dumber. <laughs> you all gotta be smart as we go through this. In fact, my Chancellor Pradeep said, you can't say that to anybody, Vince. Well, I just did here, so you can quote me as you see fit. Uh, but it's a challenge I have in administrative land because administrators want the easy button, and there isn't one. Pictorially, you can think about this horizontal and vertical AI as uh, the first tranche of this that you're seeing from OpenAI and, and Microsoft and Google and everybody is kind of a vertical, meaning uh, I call it a $30 a month screwdriver. Give every employee across the world a $30 a month screwdriver. And they can use that screwdriver to do a whole bunch of things with. So I'll call that horizontal AI. What we were focused on is how do we fo do things specific to our content? 
you are now seeing walled gardens of content pop up. The Hollywood strike and the negotiations were kind of about that. How do content creators keep their content away from other uses through the generative AI platforms? This is still going to sort out over the next few years, but I think in the enterprise land, certainly in the corporate land, uh, their data is not going to go very easily out into the cloud world. I was talking to a CTO of a large book publisher who has petabytes, petabytes, many petabytes of content of books. He's like, there's no way that's going to any of the cloud providers. It's just not happening. That is our content. we got to figure out how we're going to uh, deal with it. Lots of ways to think about where generative AI can help in the enterprise. I tend to break it down into three things. And the, the first thing we all know, which is how do you recruit words to words or images to and from words, right? And so that I consider generation, concision, and classification, basically. So it's, it's essentially linguistic manipulation with bits coming along for the ride as part of you do, as you do that manipulation. And that covers a whole lot of use cases that are important in the enterprise, certainly generation. Uh, one of the first things we're going to talk about here is job description writer. Anybody here had to write a job description? Yeah, it, was it fun? Did it take a long time? Was it like, you know, I went to HR, I said, we have a job description writer. They're like, hallelujah, thank you, because what people send us is terrible. It's, it's just messy. Uh, and so generation, generative AI works really, work, works really well. It works well at concision. Take a UC policy and summarize it for me. Fantastic use of the technology, oodles and oodles of boring content to wade through. Along with the writing, you can do things like classify. Classify this document or this set of content per this rubric and assign me a classification. Coming along for the free ride comes prediction. Because you can develop a rubric that's leaning towards prediction. All those things suddenly become possible with generative AI uh, uh, quite a bit easier. A second element of generative AI, which a lot of people focus on, is fact retrieval. And the first thing we're noticing is when we have experts evaluate our Triton GP to like, that fact is not right. I think it's hallucinating. And hallucination is a deep design to these models. It's a deep design to my mother-in-law, because when I tell her something and she replays it back to me, it's like talking to GPT-3.5 sometimes. It doesn't come back as I thought it would. So fact retrieval is still a bit of a puzzle uh, for super high levels of quality within generative AI. And then the third one, reasoning, is where a lot of people are struggling with, especially sophisticated, more elaborate reasoning problems. But I think those are the three areas where we can get gener generative AI working in an enterprise. I'm going to skip this, except by saying within our unit, we started it a year ago on uh, ideation, skunk works, all sorts of interesting use cases, just using the open AI and, and things that Microsoft were, were producing. Uh, I convinced our chancellor and our CFO to come up with $2 million of one-time funding to put, uh, make awards to people who gave great proposals for great ideas to test out. A number of those are already in the hopper. And on the academic side, it's split between academic and administrative. They're using the million dollars to look at some of the use cases on the academic side, typically in support of teaching at, uh, TAs and faculty in the classroom. We are not yet going direct to students. I know our student population. The day I unleash this on students, within 10 minutes, I'm going to hear in the news on Reddit that our students got Triton GPT to say some really crazy stuff. So we're going to take our time as we approach students. We've been doing AI training in the enterprise. That's a big part. In order to get access to the system, we're asking uh, our staff and administrators to go through some basic training to level set people on expectations and the use of AI. We're tying this all into our sense of business processes in a university. It's not AI for AI's sake. It's AI because we want to make something go better, faster, cheaper, or get rid of the boring bits for, for me, hence job description helper. We have a couple of use cases. One of them is the AI assistant, which uh, can answer questions. We've ingested into the uh, Triton GPT all of our website content, many, all of our policy procedures, job descriptions, you name it. A lot of time spent on data scrubbing, data quality, uh, uncovering documents that are old and archaic and no longer should be referenced, et cetera, but normal that you would expect. And uh, we also demoed this. Uh, some of you here used to get a kick. We demoed this to our chancellor. And uh, one of the people working with me, Brett, he is clever at the social engineering aspect of this. He decided to demo for Pradeep, oh, let's just pretend one of your staff 
has to write a speech for you about a dedication at a building related to student success. And so we had Triton GPT produce that, it pretty immediately bolted out of the room, called his staff here and said, you guys gotta get in here, you don't have a job anymore, come here. <laughs> And so we sold, basically, on one use case. Uh, not quite so, pretty much more discerning than that, but it does help uh, when you get people excited about the technology. We uh, then also did a variant of that to do the same thing just using Llama 2 without any of our institutional content. And that gives sometimes a very surprisingly different answer that people find useful. We've created our job description helper. You say, hey, I want to write a job description. You kind of type in what you think is a job description title. It will try to find what you think what it you think it needs, what, what it thinks you're saying, and give you a list of them. You pick one, type in a couple sentences, and boom, out pop, pops a job description based upon the content that we have on 1,300 job uh, templates that we've got. This reduces quite a bit of time for staff, and it's met with uh, you know something really simple and mundane like that well, well inside the jagged frontier line. So if I have an advice to my peer institution, start there. I have some institutions starting at much more moonshot ideas. I'm like, hey, start at the basics and work up. We also have actually released a, a fund manager coach for grant accountants for people to understand our policies and procedures for doing grant accounting. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, now he here's where we get into the democratization side. And there's a very subtle democratization aspect that occurs inside enterprises. It goes like this. The expert fund manager who's been doing this for 35 years says, you can't possibly release that tool because it's not good enough. Whereas the novice uses the tool and says, oh my goodness, I am learning so much. When you trust the expert to release a democratizing technology, they tend not to democratize it because they hold it to a level of standard way above the expectation of the target audience. We have to remember we're focusing on novices. We're focusing on novices. We're trying to raise them up. The research is very clear. Novices and average people get lifted up, experts far less so. So Fund Manager Coach is out and it's going to grow. We're gonna add some features to it, which I'll get into in a bit. Uh, we have other assistants uh, out there, accessibility enhancer, language conversion, how to build assessments and courses, um, how to build test banks, uh, uh, among other things. So along the way, we've been capturing lots of things that people are asking of Triton GPT, and they're listed here for your fun reading. This is the visuals, the, the, screen, the, the user interface is actually changing as we speak in the next couple days because we have an upgrade coming to the UI. But in general, it looks like this, like any other assistant, uh, GPT type thing. And uh, you can ask it questions. You can save your chats and, and replay them. Behind the scenes, we've got a much more interesting um, RAG architecture, retrieval augmented generation architecture that's kind of all you see and all open source. So uh, at the center of it is a tool called Dancer, which uh, rides on a little bit of Langchain uh, modules, but it's a new code line. It's a startup of two students who went to our school and went through our machine learning cluster. And they, about two years ago, they'd had a startup, they just got Y Combinator funding, so they quit their day jobs, they're off and running. We're using their platform to make it easier for us in IT, even though we have some AI, an AI expert here, to orchestrate how to talk to the LLM, how to chunk things up appropriately, how to deal with the embeddings, and also how to batch all the, the vector uploadings into it. So at the center of that uh, is the chat user interface, Dancer, which then talks to, on the right of that, the API service which controls the entire communication. There's a configuration database, there's a vector database, and there's a batch processor for bringing content from the outside world in. Uh, we're at, gonna start work shortly on uh, natural language to SQL for data access and crisp fact retrieval from our data warehouse at our enterprise. So as a fund manager coach, not only can you ask the as a fund manager, you can ask, hey, what are the policies for my grant? You can say, well, how much money do I have left in my grant? Without having to hit a report. And so we can do that quite straightforwardly, actually. We'll talk about how we're gonna do that and why we're doing it that way in a bit. 
Uh, on the very right-hand side under inference engine, you'll see a thing called VLLM. It's turning out to be a very popular uh, caching accelerator for how to present uh, the embeddings and tokens and everything into the LLM that does clever page level caching and sequencing of the GPUs. It can achieve four to 20x more throughput than just talking to the LLM native. So it's saving our bacon by a lot on performance. And that's out of UC Berkeley. We are right now, our workhorse is Llama 2. But we've been looking at the Mixtral and the, and the Mistral models. Uh, we're using BERT and another classifier on the side, and then uh, an E5 embeddings model from Microsoft to help with the vectorization of content. But our target architecture is multiple LLMs, uh, all of them open source right now, all of them on-prem. Any of this or all of this could run partially or wholly in the cloud. This is a containerized architecture. One of the areas we're going to talk to some cloud providers are, once you match my price, we can lift this into the cloud, but right now they can't even come close to matching our price. But for bursting and or high availability, that could be a good use case. And so we might tip into some conversations with cloud providers on that. Uh, we've been talking to another uh, faculty startup here at UC San Diego, Protopia, a way of encrypting what is confessed to the chat window non-reversibly. So it can't be reversed out. It's kind of interesting. Once you understand how uh, embeddings and tokenization works, it makes great sense. You add a little bit of noise to the neural network, the response can be slightly lower, slightly higher, but on average about the same. And that may be a way to add extra layers of security, even though we are entirely on-premise within our security footprint. Uh, the hardware, as I said earlier, is based on SDSD designs. It's NVIDIA H100s. And uh, we've been hard at work at a lot of the prompt tuning and curation of content, et cetera. Two other tools I'll talk about briefly, uh, Dancer, which I already described, but uh, we do have access to LangChain, so sometimes we dip into LangChain. But playing around with LangFlow, um, it's a great prototyping tool for visually prototyping with end users in the here and now right quickly. If not, giving advanced end users the ability to prototype themselves. By advanced, I mean some technical background. And so we're finding some uses for that. We are also going to hook this up to our data warehouse platform. By the way, our data warehouse platform is now being shared with UC Merced for student analytics, with University of Washington for student analytics, for, with Alabama State University uh, with student analytics. We're in negotiations with Chicago Public Schools for the same. Uh, and then a couple other universities for uh, some of our other activity hubs like finance, research, et cetera. You can think of this as a unified data warehouse in a very high-speed in-memory analytical tool called SAP HANA. We manage 8 billion rows of data in it and growing. We'll probably be at 12 billion somewhere in the next year or so. Uh, all of it is perfectly curated and joined up. So the user really doesn't have to worry about joining data across multiple sources. That's all done for them which now means the natural language and the generative AI connection to that is even simpler. Every generative AI uh, vendor is now busy trying to work on this problem and come out with solutions. The difference for us is uh, the way we're doing the metadata in this environment makes it very, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, and thus, we want to use Wolfram and Wolfram Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha products. Why? Our students use it. And guess who's helping us build all this platform? We have two student workers and two students at a startup. So we're actually using students to train students to also use the things that they're trained on to work for us, et cetera. And so this notion of folding in the engineering so that it reinforces the skill sets that we're using around us is an important part of this concept. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that. I think the mathematical element is quite interesting because the, it's become clear to some folks on our academic side that, geez, if we can hook this up with Mathematica, then biology students don't have to become programmers to do advanced uh, analytics. They can just simply talk and Mathematica can produce the right code for them and then link it to their particular libraries. In fact, in the corporate sector, Wolfram's already doing this to create entire data science pipelines of a sequence of steps that can be saved, preserved, and triggered via natural language. And that's exactly what we want to do uh, with Wolfram. So we hope to start that proof of concept up cert, uh, in, in a bit. And I am doing good on time, right? I'm going at a record speed. 10 minutes ago, so plenty of questions. 
The element that we see coming in next for us is we want to move from rag, we'll call it rage. So think of it as rag with execution. How do I get this architecture to actually trigger other systems in kind of a multi-agent framework? So we're starting to look at these multi-agent frameworks for dealing with either our Oracle Finance system for cloud, our UC Path system for payroll, any other system we have here. How do we orchestrate uh, uh, workflows uh, using this? We have a no-code development environment called Quali Build. We have 300 applications written that anybody here could do an application in five minutes or 10 minutes that's DocuSign-based or, or, or modest application-based very trivially. Uh, we want to use that potentially as a tool to trigger in uh, with the execution model. Uh, we're obviously looking at how to automate uh, continuous quality assurance testing, uh, keeping tabs on the quality of what the system is producing is an interesting puzzle. Especially as we look at new models with less guardrails, Llama 3 is coming out, so we're anticipating less guardrails on that, so we may have to augment uh, with some things around that. Uh, how to do prompt engineering across multiple LLMs. You get the sort of LLM lock-in approach, where you get hooked on OpenAI or Gemini or some other thing, and now you're locked in uh, on your prompt engineering. So how do you do that so that you're not doing that? As part of Dancer's value prop, they're trying to make that possible for their customers, us being one of them. We are supporting some instructional faculty use cases. I already talked about the uh, cloud bursting. I think over time, uh, looking at different chip designs, full stack LLMs, anything that saves power. Fortunately for our inference, we're not at super high end uh, energy envelopes. We're kind of at the you know, mid tier down. Um, but as time goes by, we want to continue to see what we can do to drive that downward in its cost. Right now, our engineering target is 20 to 35% of the commercial offerings. We're already below the 20%. In fact, we're probably 15% of, of the commercial offerings. But we're keeping our target on. We want to stay to one-third to one-fifth the cost of the OpenAI or the Microsoft uh, and other solutions. Uh, because I think that's what's going to enable it to be uh, ex you know, democratized successfully. We've had tons of interest uh, from other institutions, a number of conversations now, probably about seven or eight institutions. And then K through 12, which makes great sense. And we're actively looking for collaborators who wanna really push how to democratize the actual use of these technologies inside universities and educational organizations, especially those that don't have the means to do that. Whew. So I'll take a breath now and stop for questions. We have a lot of time for questions. Yeah, got it. So then I just love what you're doing. Um, you know, we have a lot of the CSUs, and that's 23 campuses that, if you're thinking about the training on this stuff, that there ought to be a scale of uniformity that would be difficult The content can be different, but the overall model is the same, right? And so inference can be shared. We don't necessarily have to fork a separate instance for everybody for inference. Some of the other pieces can be separated out very easily. It's all containerized, so it's got lots of different ways of configuring this. We're actually been talking to Ed on this topic and SDSU uh, as well. Uh, on how to do that in other universities. So we're already envisioning how to onboard other institutions. What they want is, there's a lot, there's many years of hard-won knowledge from SDSE transferred to my unit uh, and on to students on how to operate these environments at scale. And so that's what they want. They want that expertise. Of course they want the low cost uh, because we can deliver the low cost. Right now this is not what we call a high availability service where if it's down suddenly like Wi-Fi, people are yelling at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, somebody's laughing over there. So uh, I think I think absolutely this can absolutely scale pretty nicely, actually. Yeah. So uh, Jeffrey Weekly, uh, director of research IT at UC Santa Cruz. Um, imagine my surprise um, in a meeting with our vice chancellor of research when he asked me about how AI can be applied, um, and I didn't have an answer for him. 
Um, I, I guess I do now. Um, so my very simple question to you is, can we pile on? Yes, you can. And the, the, the big one that's looming out there is all research offices that handle contracts and grants have to look at the proposal and say, okay, what compliance regimes apply? That's perfect for a rubric and generative AI with a simple API call from that tool out to generative AI with a classification back and then another review perhaps by generative AI to test the quality of that and finally a human review. That's going to shave hours off of these reviews. That's just one of many. Great. Well, we'll be reaching out. Tons of use cases out there on the research uh, workflow side. Uh, hi, Remy Frazier. I'm at UCSF. Uh, and I'm uh, some of the teams that I work with are doing uh, adjacent work to the UCSF LLM bet. Um, one of the questions I have is, are you exposing any of your backend services uh, as API calls that people can use to call out to the construction that you've built uh, without having to go through a chat tool? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, there's a whole API layer that we can talk about. Okay. Right now we're kind of carefully gapping it, air gapping it as possible. But yes, there's an API service that you saw in there, and that's the way to get in and out. Okay. So, absolutely. Um, and is your deployment IS3 compliant and P3, P4, <laughs> which is very UC inside baseball? Uh, that's a complicated answer okay. on P3, P4. Um, and yes, it, it is and can okay. be, but the depending on how you do this, especially where that Protopia tool comes in, something it gets a little more interesting. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I had a question, and maybe you've answered it already, but I'm asking it again anyway. How do you envision this to work with other universities? Do they bring their data here, and then you have a separate instance that gets trained, and you provide that as a service? Or what exactly would you yes. ima imagine? If you go back to this architecture diagram, the, the basic way is we think that this cluster called Config Database, Vector Database, Batch Processor, API Service, and perhaps Knowledge Graph, become a separate instance per location. The right-hand side, the inference engine, just might be one monolithic thingy that everybody consumes. It sort of depends on capacity and all that and throughput and how we want to look at that. Um, so that, that actually that entire retrieval augmented generation thing can be just simply cloned and then customized per institution. That's how I would want to do it if I were a CIO at another institution um, because I might want to just load up, uh, rather than have one big vector database of everybody's content, have my own partitioned off. And that's fine. It, there's no reason why not to do that. And it's, it, does it imply that if a, a, a campus uh, X wants to play, would it imply that they have to move their data here? We would ingest it via the ingestion protocol. So where it says UCSD content, just put University X. Okay. And the same ingestion method, standard API-based uh, approach or HTTP-based approach to ingest the content would work on their content, suck it into the vector database in their environment. Thank you. We've been thinking about that a fair bit. And part of the point of the collaboration is to figure out what are the design patterns that are going to work for institutions. So let's thank Lince again.